Elves are beautiful and enchanting creatures, a grandeur in a world of wonders. This lovely lady here is a vision of such beauty. She's currently on the ground in a forest, lost and discombobulated. And just her luck, an orc finds her. Oh no, the orc assures her that he doesn't attack people, but ooh, you don't get it. You think the oh no was for the elf? Nope, she's distraught as she asks why he wouldn't attack her and proceeds to goad him into doing so. He should attack her, violate her, make a mess out of, whoa, ma'am, let me stop you right there. Anyway, she keeps inviting him to go open season on her, but the orc just tells her to stop talking nonsense and go back to her village. The forest is dangerous after all. Well, too late for that. Our lady elf has been exiled from her village. Why, you ask? It's because, and I quote verbatim, for saying I want to go on a journey to get violated by orcs. Uh, yeah, orc can't believe this chick. The lady elf explains that she got lost searching for the forbidden fruit, and now she finally found one. But once again, the orc doubles down on not attacking people. He still doesn't get it. She seeks the green snake of the forest. After her incessant begging, her stomach growls. She hasn't eaten anything for days. Though hesitant, the orc ultimately offers to give her something to eat. The overjoyed elf jumps at the food hanging before her. Itadakima! No, not that! The orc picks her up and carries her on his shoulder. But this is a totally new experience for the elf who's just touched orc muscle for the first time. Needless to say, she's one excited elf. Orc, however, ain't happy about it. He gives her a death stare, saying that he'll get angry if she keeps it up. But well, elf hormones go brrr at that. At his home, Elf thanks him for the wonderful meal, but claims that she can't go back until she has a taste of the golden, or should I say, emerald ingredient. Finally, Orc relents and asks why she wants that so badly, and this sparkly-eyed girl passionately answers that she's heard fantastic reviews about it. Five stars. This comes as a surprise for the orc. Apart from the fighting, orcs have literally ravaged elves during the war. She shouldn't repeat that kind of tragedy. As the lone survivor of his clan, he's made a vow never to assault anyone. He's really serious about this, and Elf actually finds him so lovely and noble, but it just makes her want him even more. At this point, the orc knows that she's a hopeless case. The orc dismisses her again, telling her to go home. There's nothing that can change his mind, but who's he fooling? She knows that something rises every time he touches her, and it's not his blood pressure. Embarrassed, the monster quickly frees himself from her embrace. Whatever it is, it's simply orc instinct, not his true feelings. Ah, oh, he's so cute. It's nighttime, and Orkson still hasn't gotten rid of the elf. He's left with no choice but to let her stay till morning. He's confident that he'll keep his vow till the end. Elf Chan doesn't waste time and presents her pie to him. He ignores her teasing and imposes a condition on her. He'll let her stay as a guest if she doesn't touch him, but she reads his bluff. He doesn't want her to touch him because of that rising thing we talked about a couple seconds ago. To this, Orc admits that even he is trying his best to control his instincts. Sensing that the orc's about to give in, she enters a state of nature, prompting the creature to beg her to put her clothes back on. If she keeps this up, they won't have dinner. Oh, sir, don't threaten her with a good time. Despite being in the orc's home, the elf has him on a string. She keeps teasing him and even goes rope bunny on him under the pretense of covering up, leaving Orc to scramble about what he should do. After freeing her from the ropes, she jumps on his back for some skin-to-skin -skin action. She sends the poor Orc to his limit with a subtle ear bite. To fight against his burning passion, the Orc bangs his head on the wall, knocking himself out. When the Orc wakes up, Elf Chan recalls the day she got exiled from her village. She told her younger sister about her very questionable desires. Her unthinkable words made her sister question if she was one of them. Her younger sister tried to talk her out of her absurd dream by saying orcs are on the verge of extinction, but she misheard that and thought orcs were on the verge of evacuation, but like, put a letter J in there. Little sis reminded her of the elf people's painful history at the hands of the orcs, and she's well aware of that. She even knows that the intense attack traumatized their noble chief, and yet she wants to experience it too, and just thinking about it has her bursting her bladder. She could settle for humans if she wanted it so much since they match her energy, but she insisted that only orcs could satisfy her, something too complex for her sister to comprehend. The noble chief overheard her plan to leave the village to find orcs and reminded her of the consequences. 
Elf Chan cried foul for this injustice. She claimed it was unfair that only the chief had experience. Shocked by the elf's words, the chief recounted the horrors she went through. But the more she talked, the more the elf wanted it too. Realizing she's a lost cause, the chief allowed Elf Chan to leave the village and see how scary the orcs are. However, she could never return once she left and did the unthinkable. But that's all Elf Chan needed to hear as she rushed outside the village and into the forests, leaving the chief in disbelief. And that's when she met the orc. She bets it was one of those fateful encounters. It's a new day, and Orc San is thankful he could protect his vow for another night. He isn't going to give up easily. No amount of exposure, suggestive food, and cheap tricks will sway him to let his guard down. Or up. Whatever. He's fed up with her antics, so he ties her up, not to play along, but to bring her back to the elf village. On their way to the village, they encounter two elves who mistakenly assume that the orc has abducted the lady elf. The two elves order the orc to release Elf Chan. Great timing. He drops the elf like a hot potato and goes on his way. However, the male elves try to shoot him with arrows. Elf Chan begs them not to hurt the monster. If he's gone, then who's going to make her explode? The male elves are unsure what she means, but untie her anyway. She tries to go after the orc, saying she wants to get bodied by him. Well, about that, the male elves offer themselves only to get savagely rejected by our elf girl. She's looking for the big guns and not some lousy arrows. With a hurt ego, one of the male elves tries attacking Elf Chan. Before things get worse, Orc comes to the rescue. He may be a brute, but he's got manners. He would never touch a woman like that. But to the smitten elf girl, she's already his woman. Our elf girl is at it again with starry eyes and drooling over incredible Orc. Thinking ahead, Orc San contains the elf and gives her a passionate headbutt. While the woodland sprite is knocked out, the Sigma Orc delivers her to the village, where the village chief herself meets them. The chief's eyes widen as she is reminded of her past hardship at the hands of the orcs. And now, an orc has visited their village uninvited. The chief sweats as she ponders what the ogre might be up to. Her thoughts tell her the orc is here to taste them all. As the village head, she must protect her people from the orc blade. She confronts the monster and reluctantly presents herself as a tribute in exchange for her people's safety. Stumped by the village chief's bold declaration, the orc clarifies that he isn't here to shed blood, one way or another. He only came to return the elf girl, and obviously, he didn't tickle any of her elven jewels. Like hell such an orc exists, exclaims the chief. Her bad blood with orcs runs deep, and understandably so. The mere thought of her harrowing past is almost enough to make her faint. The orc comes closer to see if she's okay, but she shoes him away. Fed up with all the elven crap, Mr. Orc decides to leave. However, the chief comes up with a questionable idea. In hopes of overcoming her trauma, she musters her courage and holds the orc's hand. But she faints and drools all of a sudden. The male elves see this and mistake the orc for hurting their chief. The orc pleads his innocence for the millionth time, but even he can't understand what's happening. The visibly struggling chief draws her face closer to the orcs, but she can't contain whatever she's feeling and falls to her knees. The other elves look at their delirious leader, who's slowly losing her senses. While on her knees with her back turned to the monster, she tells the orc she's fine like this. She quickly looks just below the orc's waist and sees the hump hidden underneath his loincloth, revitalizing her with unexplainable energy. She claims that his balrog doesn't phase her or feel good before reaching for the orc staff. With this, the chief believes she has conquered her fear. Not so fast. What did she think was gonna happen by doing that? She feels the staff leveling up, and the sensation drives her crazy. She screams while the other elves watch her lose her sanity and decency. The chief orders the orc to leave the village along with the banished elf. It's more like a plea, as the village chief literally cries and begs Orkson to remove his hanging garden from her sight, and he better not come back, or she might not be able to hold it anymore. Orkson hurriedly carries the elf girl out of the village. Even he is starting to fear for his safety. When our elf girl wakes up, she's back at Orkson's house. It's safe to say she missed very important plot points. Anyway, Orkson tells her they went to the village but got thrown out by the chief. And no, he didn't do anything. He didn't even think about it. Still, Orkson knows he must protect his vow every day, especially in the presence of thirsty elves. But Elf Chan assures him that won't be necessary. For a moment, 
Orkson thinks the elf lady finally regained her senses and decided to stop all this nonsense. Boy, he's wrong. Elf Chan claims he doesn't have to force his entry if she willingly opens the door. And once inside, she'll level up the party. This way, Orkson can keep his vow. Sounds like a win-win situation. But our orc has some manners. He believes something like this should be done between people who truly love each other. Well, he shouldn't have said that. Because Elf Chan confesses that she likes him. He gets stunned so badly that he almost turns into a red orc. She wants his reply, but he can only say, I don't hate you. That was cute, but not the reaction she wanted. Elf Chan says this nonsense doesn't suit an orc and takes matters into her own hands. But before they arrive at the point of no return, a goblin barges in, calling for his big bro orc. He's quite stunned to see what the orc has gotten himself into, and he mentions that orcs broken his vow already. Oh, you better watch your mouth, little guy, because you just pissed the hell out of Elf. With the Yandere spirit taking over her, she tries to shank him, which just pisses the goblin off. If she wants a fight, then it's a fight she'll get. To keep the two from killing each other, Orc chimes in to drop a bomb that shocks everyone, probably himself included. She's my lover. Elf Chan can hardly believe what her darling said. Yup, darling, good luck trying to clear that up. Now that they're official, Elf Chan wants to spice things up by going to the beach, but it has little effect on Orc San, who has seen her with nothing on too many times. She asks him to put sunscreen on her back, to which he agrees, only for her to bear her frontal features. He won't give in, though. Still, he's quite nervous about touching her, so she suggests closing his eyes to remedy this. Ooh. He's surprised that her back is so soft and humpy. Well, because it's not her back. Elf Chan's wish finally comes true. Orksan's burning hot for her. Well, mostly because of the sunscreen with lots of flammable components. In the end, nothing happened at the beach. To this day, the pair is yet to have some real action. Every time they try, the goblin comes out of nowhere and ruins everything. Seriously though, who gave him the keys? It's the 50th time now. Orksan suspects that she might be cursed. That or she's just downright unlucky. Coincidentally, he sees a curse mark on her left soul. She's really cursed. Cursed or not, nothing's stopping Elf Chan from reaching the promised land. Don't take her hormones lightly, she declares. She tries again. But this time, a random apple crashes through the window and into her face. That's something even Newton can't explain. That ain't stopping her, though. She tries again. But this time, a geyser spurts her into the atmosphere, further than the team rocket ever reached. Orkson tells her to calm down. Otherwise, her body and his house won't hold up. But she thinks she can work around the curse by cutting her foot. She won't need it during the act anyway. Ever the level-headed man, Orkson calms the lady elf and smooches her. Boom! Elf Chan's world stopped as she discovered something so good. Not just her, Orkson almost fainted from the thrill. Meanwhile, the chief calls for Elf Chan's sister's help in the village. She wants to get over her humiliation by the orcs and restore the solemn image of a chief village. The chief has been stabbing orc dummies all this time. But to overcome her trauma, she must face a realistic looking orc. That's why she needs the young elf's illusion magic. The young elf's first attempt is a small and chubby orc, much to the chief's disappointment. Don't underestimate the orcs like that, the chief exclaims. Understandable. Orcs are supposed to look big and scary. To the young elf's defense, she was born after the war, so she wouldn't know what an orc looks like. It can't be helped, so the chief shows her a photo taken during the war of her and some orcs. Never mind how they got cameras, but the pic looks super sus. The chief looks satisfied. The chief says Elf Chan thought the same when she saw the picture. Yikes! Is this Elf's origin story? Anyway, the chief insists that this photo only exists to showcase how scary the orcs are. Speaking of fear, her body's trembling just remembering those stories. Yeah, I can see why Elf Chan's off her rockers. This time, the young elf creates a near-perfect illusion of an orc big and scary. However, there's one thing clearly lacking, the orc's staff. The young elf didn't underestimate anything, but how would she know? The chief goes berserk, saying those swords have punished and humiliated elves from heaven to hell. Sounds terrifying. The girl adjusts the orc's staff to appease the chief, and she keeps doing it until she's satisfied. Hell, she's even drooling. Anyway, with a realistic orc before her, the chief battles the monster. Swords are ineffective against them, 
so she falls captive. The younger elf claims that the whole thing just worsened the chief's trauma. Also, if it weren't for the picture, Elf Chan would have never got excited about orcs. Tisk tisk. Still, Sister can't believe that the orcs brought magic cameras that time. The village head explains that the orcs stole their magic camera and her purity, but the young elf wants none of that story. At Orksan's house, the two mull over how to lift Elf Chan's curse. It's not that he's eager about the nasty, rather, he feels bad for her having a curse. There's less pressure now since they've discovered an alternative, smooching. Suddenly, someone strikes Orksan, and it's not the goblin, it's Elf San's father. Papa Mage expresses his disappointment upon learning that all the gossip about his daughter is true. Luckily, he cast a spell to protect her from Orc staff. He tells her to go home with him now. Elf Chan is shocked to hear this. Her father, of all people, is is getting in the way of her happiness. It's not a curse, according to him, but love. He cast it when she was asleep at some point. She isn't thrilled, though. She then asks him to lift the curse so she can see stars, so she can elevate, so she can meet God. With a wink, Papa asserts that he can get her that with his magic. Bro, what, what, and let me check my notes. What in the hell? Even the deranged and debauched Elf Chan tells him not to say something so disgusting. But fine, she doesn't need the curse lifted since lipping's all good, too. Oops. She shouldn't have said that to her protective father. Now, he'll put a curse that forbids her to kiss anymore. Orksan interrupts them and asks the father if he can undo the curse. The father lashes out at the monster for wanting to hit on his daughter. Orksan quickly explains his pure intentions, which Elfsan misconstrues as a marriage proposal. The father understands the orc's words, but doesn't believe an orc can control his beastly urge. These cruel words, however, are enough for Orksan to punch the mage in the face. In a language only men can understand, the father agrees to undo the curse on one condition. Orksan must endure the new curse on him for one month. If his sword ever rises, his heart will stop. And with that, the caring father disappears. The new curse puts the pair's plans in peril. Orksan can control himself for a month, but what about Elfchan? He strikes a deal with her. If she can hold on for a month, he'll play any game she wants. Done deal. Elfchan is confident she can do her part of the deal, so confident that she dares Orksan to show his staff, but her determination wavers when she sees it. What deal? Despite her struggle, Elfchan manages to stave off the temptation. She wouldn't even let Orksan touch her. Oh, wait, she touched him. Touching his chest sends shivers down her spine. She trips, and Orksan grabs her with his arms wrapped around her chest. Elfsan's struggle is at an all time high. Before she gives in, she turns around and smooches him, immediately activating his curse mark. Orksan realizes what's about to happen and pushes Elfsan away before the serpent comes out of hiding. While doing so, he accidentally grabs her thingamabobs. At this rate, he will definitely die. He desperately punches his lap, and somehow, it calms down. Talk about beating into submission. After a brush with disaster, the pair head to the Imperial Palace, where Elfchan's father works as a magician. They beg him to release the curse, but he refuses. He has second thoughts, though, after seeing his daughter's condition. She looks just about ready for death. However, he makes it clear he can't accept their relationship. The reason is pretty dark. The mage's wife, Elfsan's mother, was humiliated by orcs before him. Man, that must have been rough, Orksan said sympathetically. Worse, she looked more satisfied than doing it with him. Oh no, Papa's crying. God, that must have been rough, Orksan says, looking more perturbed now. For this reason, he believes all orcs should perish from the world. And yet, he let Orksan live when he was still a baby. But if he disappears from the face of this earth, then this daughter won't suffer. Without warning, this freaking weirdo unravels Elf's bazooka right in front of Orc to force the serpent out. But that doesn't do anything because, unlike everyone in this mess of a story, Orc has sense. And sense dictates that you don't just do something like that to women, to your own daughter no less. His rocker isn't going pauper because his anger is greater than desire right now. Ooh, you dropped your crown, king. Orksan's fed up with getting blamed for crimes he hasn't even committed. And finally, he finds something he must do. That is to make Elfsan happy. And he'll do much better than her own father. Orksan is determined to have him remove the curse at all costs. He hates resorting to violence, but he hates twisted thinking even more. If Papa doesn't remove the curse, he'll seriously beat him up. Since Papa isn't taking Ork seriously, he breaks the wall behind the mage with a single punch. Just so you know, I didn't even use 10% of my power, he warns. Ooh, 
king. To prove his words, Orkson dares the mage to replace the curse with another that will kill him if he makes her unhappy. Tears fall from the father's eyes as he admits defeat. He releases the curse and gives his blessing. Despite being free from the curse, the two settle for lovey-dovey moments instead of getting rough. After hugs, smooches, and tighter hugs, the two finally get to know each other's names. Elfson's real name is Liba, while Orkson's name is Frieden. The two seemingly unlock a new level of intimacy by learning each other's names. A more intricate mouth game follows, and well, things escalated quickly. The next day, Goblin shows up and checks in on his big bro's action. It turns out they've never done it. They reason out that they experience an avalanche just from smooching, so they resolve to take things slowly. Ah, oh, that's right, no shame in early blasts. Back at the village, Chief Elf is at it again. Coincidentally, a watchman informs her of Liba and Frieden approaching the gate. Without hesitation, the chief orders her men to kill them. Although fighting with other tribes is against their rules, the chief's orders are absolute. The pair drops by to inform Liba's younger sister and everyone else that they are getting married. The chief has an issue with that. Liba wants the smoke, though. She riles up the chief by saying she will experience what she once experienced back then every day. She even flaunts Frieden's pecker for the chieftain. The village leader is at a loss for words when she sees that the orc's base form is already indomitable. The chief elf resorts to sour graping, claiming it's impossible to sheathe a sword that big. Liba dares the chief to try it herself. Careful, Liba, she's literally starving. As the chief elf fights her urge and tries to talk herself out this, Liba's already imagining the experience. Soon, the two quarrel over who gets the diggity dog dog. The chief abandons her senses and bears her great personality in public. However, Frieden says he isn't interested in her. Ouch. His eyes and everything else are for Liba only. Having dealt with the humiliation of being rejected by an orc and being seen by her people, the chief elf shoots her final shot, but to no avail. Liba and Frieden leave her thirsty and probably in danger of losing her position and respect in the village. It's Valentine's Day, the day all girls give the one they love their crap. Even Frieden is appalled by this declaration. Frieden emphatically denies her request. Seriously, did she put her crap in there? Since she can't get him to eat that, Liba asks Frieden for his for the upcoming White Day. Another day, another Liba wild idea. This time, she wants to bathe in his orc extract. But Frieden has an even wilder idea. He wants to break up. Although he tried to put up with her weird fantasies, it was one unimaginable request after the other. He can no longer satisfy her, so it's best to go separate ways. And he never jokes. Liba cries after hearing these parting words, but seems to snap out of her delusion. Frieden realizes that he might have rushed his judgment and embraces her. He says he'll keep up with her craze as long as it doesn't involve dumps. Risky deal indeed. The next day, Liba comes up with another game. She challenges Frieden to a snow melting contest using their wee wee. Yikes. Request denied. Snowballs shoved up their peaches? Hell no. To stop her from saying weird stuff, Frieden suggests building a snowman, but she wants to make only the sussy bits, and the loser will have to accept any one request of the winner. Frieden ends up agreeing, but Liba is so good at this that the more realistic her work is, the more she wants to taste it. For the first time ever, Frieden screams from the bottom of his heart. When the pair wakes up, they are greeted by a woman who's already made herself at home. The woman claims she's here to teach them how to have a rodeo. When Liba sees who it is, she screams, Mother! Mamma Mia! Liba's mom says she came here after receiving a letter from her mage husband. As an experienced veteran, she now offers them free rodeo lessons. Frieden politely rejects the offer, but the next thing he knows, he's tied up and his staff fully ready. Despite his predicament, Frieden insists on his vow. Liba backs him up too, but Mama Elf isn't playing. In an instant, she bears Liba and imparts some wisdom, if you can call it that. The feeling of devouring an orc is even better than being ravaged by an orc. She tells Liba the basics of being an equestrian, while Frieden stares in disbelief. He asks Mama Elf if her insanity was caused by the punishment she experienced during the war. Wait, who said she was punished? No, she was the one who punished 
banished orcs. You heard that right. Papa Mage lost the plot. Mama Elf is so into this that she volunteers to show her daughter how it's done. Liba tries to stop her, but Mama Elf reveals her true intentions. She's also craving orc meat. When Mommy realizes Frieden is a cherry boy, she ties Liba up and jumps on him. But before she can baptize him, Liba breaks free and returns the favor to her mother. Realizing the pair's sincere feelings, Mama Elf concedes and blesses their relationship. Shortly after, Mama Elf visits her husband at the palace. Since the two have not seen action together in a long while, guess what? They finally do. That sounds about right. One day, Frieden invites Liba to buy some food, but the elf lady has her eyes set on something else. She can't eat that, though. Not yet. Anyway, Frieden dresses up like he's Aragorn in The Prancing Pony. The reason for his getup is not to scare people away. Still, he's more worried about Liba losing her cool in public. And there it goes. They haven't even bought anything, and Liba's already burying her personality in public. After shopping, the two come across a magical ice cream shop that sells custom-shaped popsicles. Of course, we know what our lady elf ordered. It gets worse when she starts eating the ice cream like the real thing. Even Frieden is touched by it. Liba can no longer control her emotions while Frieden tries to rush back home. She runs after him and accidentally steps on his cloak, revealing his face to the people. Before the commotion starts, Frieden carries Liba, and the two escape the city center. The two stop when they enter the woods, and he passionately kisses her. He tells her to hold it for a bit until they get home. He's serious about it now, and she's still crazy. It's only a matter of time before the lines blur and Liba and Frieden become one. But for now, they perfectly suit each other. A serious orc and a crazy elf, who would have thought? Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.